Welcome everyone to CEPR's latest virtual associates meeting. <clears throat> I'm Mark Duggan, the Triani Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and I'm thrilled to welcome our speaker today, Maya McGinnis. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in to watch this afternoon. Even with the COVID crisis preventing us from being in the same room together, I'm really happy that we're able to continue these events online and still stay somewhat connected. I'm grateful for all of your support and hope that you and your families are staying healthy, safe, and well during this uh, very challenging time we're in. Uh, in a few weeks, on Tuesday, August 18th, we'll be joined by David Crane, a lecturer in Stanford's public policy program and an expert on public finances, who will be talking about COVID's impact on state and local budgets. But today we're going to be looking at how things are playing out at the federal level, as Maya discusses the federal debt and deficits in, in the uh, economy uh, with, uh, with the COVID pandemic. And, and just a warning, I don't think that we're in for an especially uplifting talk. Uh, the United States so far in the, uh, in the current fiscal year has run a $2.7 trillion deficit uh, for the first nine months. Uh, and that's about $8,000 per person in the US. So that's uh, not a small number. Just for some context, that's nearly double the previous record for an entire year of $1.4 trillion set in the 2009 recession, and four times greater than for the same first nine months uh, last year. Uh, but I'm hoping that Maya will have a glimmer of good news for us, or at least some suggestions for how policymakers can think about dealing with this large deficit and the associated increase in the federal debt. This topic is all the more important as Congress is currently considering another round of stimulus to offset the adverse economic effects of the pandemic. As the president of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, Maya oversees an organization that is dedicated to working with politicians on both sides of the political aisle to help them develop sound policies that will improve the country's fiscal and economic condition. The committee is a hugely important government watchdog and they work closely with journalists and other organizations to bring greater accountability to the federal budgeting process. In addition to working directly with Republican and Democratic members of Congress and candidates running for office, Maya's ideas and influence often shine through in the national press and in her own writing and through making appearances like this. This is actually Maya's second time with us at CEPR. She headlined another one of our associates meetings on campus back in 2018. The economic policy topics that she covered then are even more important today. And so we're really delighted to welcome her back. And I really wish that uh, she could be here in person, both to catch up with her in person and also to allow her to escape from the 100 degree temperatures and high humidity in Washington, D.C. But alas, she is still there. Uh, and so we're sorry that we, we can't have you uh, here with us, Maya. But with that, um, you can submit questions for Maya through the link that's just below this video. And with that, I'm delighted to turn things over to Maya McGinnis. Thank you. Um, does that work? Can you hear me? Like the obligatory Zoom check. Um, and in, in that nice introduction, you forgot to say high temperatures, high humidity, and broken air conditioner in the second floor. Of my home. So uh, I'm really, really sad I'm not there in person with the whole, with the whole group. But I had such a nice time when I came out and visited last time. And um, I was depressed then and how things have gotten worse. So so I will not be the most, most uplifting speaker. Um, I know it was like a cocktail reception when I came last time and it's the middle of the day, so there can't really be drinks, but it will be a topic and a talk worthy of, of depressed drinks, I fear. Okay, so uh, let me just jump right in. Um, and I'm really, I must say, most looking forward to the discussion part of this. Um, it's such a great group of people who you had join us last time. I really enjoyed a lot of the people who I got a chance to to talk with. What I thought I would do um, in the, discuss the presentation and then discussion part, basically touch on three things. Um, where the fiscal situation was going in and where we are now with that. Um, what we've done so far in terms of responding to the multi-crises that have been tossed at us. And then how we think about this, this in the longer run. Um, because this is a multi-staged process, I would say. So just to start, um, probably to state the obvious, but we're in the midst of one of the most unconventional, or probably the most unconventional downturn of our times. Um, I remember that about 
Nine months ago, our organization put out a blueprint called Break the Class, Break the Glass, which came from knowing that when um, that soon we were going to be hitting some kind of a downturn because we'd had such a long expansion. And we wanted to think ahead and get ahead of the idea that when there was a downturn, we'd need to borrow a lot, but we were going into it with a lot of debt. How do we think about that? And we offered a blueprint, which basically had short-term stimulus measures, long-term offsets. And we had a huge discussion internally about how much should we think about what different kinds of packages we'll need depending on the different kind of downturn. It could be fiscal, it could be financial, it could be a shock to the system. But basically we came up with, it doesn't much matter because um, so many of the recessions really are quite similar in their, their shape, their design, and what the needs are. Um, how wrong we were. This is really just such a remarkable and unique um, downturn in the fact that, I mean, first off, it was in fact predictable, right? We, we have known for a long time that there are all these different crises we should be planning for. Um, uh oh, I'm getting a notice that my internet is unstable. So if there are problems somehow, let me know. Um, but it, it could have been predictable. We could have we could have been more prepared for this specific kind of pandemic as we could have for all different crises. But we didn't spend nearly enough time actually preparing for it. But what I don't think we really thought about was having an economic downturn where you are quite literally shutting down the economy and throwing out the normal rule book. Um, and you actually don't want people to be working or spending because you need to be fighting the pandemic first and foremost in a way that's making the economic situation worse. And for that reason, this is so much harder to wrap your arms around what the solution should be than a normal, a plain old normal vanilla, vanilla already quite painful recession. So that's where we are. Um, and then another point about it is it's global. So often when you have a recession, you are able to kind of diversify throughout the world. That is not the case here. The risks are all the same. Um, the scarcity that is going on is not going on at the identical moment, but it is certainly affecting us because we're fighting over resources. This is a phenomenon you see both globally, where countries are competing for different things that are necessary, and you also see it domestically, where our states have been competing for different things because of the organization of the response to this downturn. So there are a lot of factors that are really different than normal. Um, the way I think about this is I really think there are four crises that we're going through. Health crisis, obviously, the pandemic, the economic crisis, something I talked about last time I was out there a lot, but it's only gotten worse, the polarization crisis, the fact that how divided we are as a country, and obviously we can see this in the fight about masks, but how we take basically any opportunity now at both the government level and it's becoming at the citizen level um, and find a way to disagree on it. And that makes finding any response more difficult. As we'll talk about, the, the first layers of response to this were quite impressively bipartisan. I fear that that level of cooperation is coming to an end. Um, so we have the polarization crisis, I think. And then finally, we have a potential debt, um, you know, a huge debt challenge that we will have to face and deal with once we get through this. So let's go um, ahead to the first slide. I just have a couple slides, kind of as the backdrop of the overall situation to visualize just how um, serious the situation that we are in is. And when we entered, so if you had gone prior to where that 3.7 is, if we had been talking about the deficit before this, I would have been talking about how bad the fiscal situation is. Because when we um, entered this downturn, our debt relative to the economy was twice as high as it has been historically in this country, the historical average. It was twice as high as the last downturn. It was twice as high as when we entered um, into um, the downturn of 2008. Actually, if you could go to the next slide, that'll show better. Keep this one in your mind. Go to the next slide, please. And that shows the debt. Um, so it was twice as high when we, as when we went into 2008. And already, as the last slide just showed us, we were on track to have trillion dollar deficits every year forever or more. They'd be growing over time. And why that's so shocking is this was during a period of uh, relative economic strength. This was the expansion period. We are not an organization that thinks you need to balance the budget. The only real benefit of balanced budgets per se is that they're easy to understand and, and helpful for citizens to kind of have as a target that everybody understands, but they don't have um, 
any economic importance and they're not right in that they should be more flexible. You want to be able to borrow during downturns and you want to get your fiscal house back in order during periods of economic strength. We got the borrowing downturn during downturns part figured out. We're pretty good at that. What we are not good at is the part of getting the deficit back under control during the period of expansion. And we so spectacularly failed to do that last round that Congress passed and the president signed into law $4.7 trillion in new borrowing in the couple of years, the few years running up to uh, this crisis that we were hit. And that came from started with actually smaller things than the big ones that people have heard about, but massive expansion for healthcare spending in the SGR. But really from the big ones were unpaid for tax cuts, followed by, followed by two massive unpaid for spending increases. So that brought us to the situation. Maybe you could go back to the deficit slide just so you can get a sense of both of these numbers. But this brings us to where we are now. So we're supposed to have trillion dollar deficits. This year, we're going to be having a deficit that we're calculating will be $3.7 trillion, quadruple how large it was last year. The debt will exceed the size of the entire economy this year, something that hadn't been projected to happen for an entire decade. Um, and the previous record in terms of debt to GDP that was set at the end of World War II, we will surpass that next year. And our projections are based on no further stimulus, which is clearly wrong. There will be. We just didn't want to put it into our numbers until it happened. So all of these numbers will actually be worse. Um, that is not to say that this is the wrong thing to do. As I'll say, this borrowing, this amount of borrowing is all absolutely the right thing to do. But we are so foolish and reckless, frankly, to have entered this moment as fiscally over indebted as we were so that we were unprepared for this moment. And when we come out of it, so far borrowing isn't constrained. We're very lucky about that. But when we come out of it, we will really be in uncharted territory so that we won't say, be able to breathe that sigh of relief. OK, the economy is recovering. We're on strong, strong, fiscal, uh, strong economic ground because we'll have to turn our attention to the fiscal situation that is so bad. Um, and let me just talk briefly about why this matters. One of my biggest challenges running a, a nonpartisan group on fiscal policy is getting people to care and understanding why it matters and how it's connected to their lives. Because whether you want massive tax cuts and smaller government and very conservative, whether you want a huge expansion of government, uh, bigger government programs, um, you know, higher levels of taxation, higher levels of government, any of those are massively affected by our fiscal situation. But what people are thinking about are the policies involved, tax cuts, health care, Social Security, defense spending. And it's definitely hard to connect this issue. Um, I think this is a more sophisticated audience where it's probably pretty familiar to people. But just to tick through some of some of the many things I stay up at night worrying about. But of course, once your debt gets to a certain level, it's high enough that it has economic effects in the economy. Um, and even with the incredibly low interest rates we have in the country, and we can talk more about that, um, you still, uh, the, the literature on the topic shows that we're still experiencing crowding out um, in our economy, which leads to slower growth. And it is such an important time, not in this downturn per se, we know that's we have to fight this in the moment, but more broadly to think about how we're going to grow the economy because we have this massive challenge, which is the headwinds of the aging of the baby boomers and the demographics that are moving against us. And so already growth is projected to be below 2% on average. This is not counting recessions. Below 2% going forward um, rather than, than the higher numbers we've seen in the past. And that's due to the fact that the labor market won't be expanding um, as quickly as it has been. The contribution from labor market growth will be much smaller. So you wanna do everything you can to promote growth Debt works in the opposite direction. Number two, whatever your budget preferences, back to that big government, small government, whatever amount of money you're spending on interest instead of fighting about the other resources in the pie um, is really wasted money in that sense. Now, if what we were doing is borrowing for massive investments that paid off in higher economic growth, that would be a different story. Uh, but we should not confuse what we're doing with productive borrowing. We are borrowing to consume and the interest payments and the kicking the can down of the overall payments is just basically the shifting of the cost of who's going to pay for today's consumption to a very large uh, extent. It's really not focused on investment. 
third issue is fiscal space right where we are in this moment you want to be able to borrow as much as possible without concern um, we certainly have no signs of the problems of borrowing right now but in many ways that is masked because of the actions of the federal reserve where the huge repurchase huge purchases of our debt don't leave the U.S. competing for capital the way we normally would be. So we have two advantages. We have that we're the safe haven, and we have this unique situation where when the economy is bad, global or domestic, uh, people tend to buy U.S. debt because it's still seen as relatively safe, safe and things are seen as stable here. So we have that advantage, that advantage that there's higher demand for our debt when times are tough, along with the extraordinary actions of the Federal Reserve. But all that um, to some extent, artificially keeps down interest rates that papers over the cost of all the borrowing we're doing. And in many ways, it pushes forward the date of reckoning when you have this much debt, this much de demand, um, how how that will play out in interest rates and or inflation and or currency issues. Fourth issue I'd put there, um, it's just the missed opportunities. Before this moment, it was so apparent the huge shifts that were going on in our economy that we needed to be thinking about primarily from issues like technology, changing the way the economy is going to work and the workforce is going to work and the notion of what things a safety net needs to worry about. But instead of ever having that discussion on our federal budget where our resources should be going, we are basically locked in. Our dollars are pre um promised to social security medicare intergenerational programs like that and it's very hard to undo any spending that's in the budget very very hard um and so we have failed for decades i would say looking back we failed to take the kinds of investment spending that we should have instead of all the consumption spending and our infrastructure is kind of exhibit one exhibit a of that fact and two we are in the midst of failing to prepare for the massive and incredibly fast-paced shifts in the economy where if we were doing this right all the changes and benefits from technology could be really used to partner with kind of the changes in the economy could be partnering with technology in a way that could be so beneficial but i'm very fearful that as we don't get programs of life lifelong learning real programs of worker retraining, things like this up and running, a social contract that deals with risk and dislocation throughout your working career more than the end of life. We need to shift where these issues are. We're not having any of these discussions and our budget is old and ossified and outdated. Um, and then finally, there's a security element to this. There's, there is a reason that all of the national security experts have pointed to the national debt as one of the major threats to national security. And so for those reasons, and you will hear from plenty of people these days that the debt doesn't matter, you shouldn't worry about it, with a whole host of lovely sounding theories to back that up. But for all of those reasons, it is a real risk. And the bottom line is I look at the national debt being exceedingly high as it is as um, a sign of the massive vulnerabilities we have. Being fiscally responsible is really about sort of being um, risk averse to all the different things that could come along and being prepared for those challenges. And I say we are, are failing on pretty much any of those fronts. Um, really wish I had air conditioning. Um, there's just a couple things because uh, I've seen in the newspapers some of that wishful thinking, just a couple of the debt myths that you tend to hear a whole lot these days. Um, so next year we're going to we're going to reach that level of the record of debt to GDP that was uh, achieved right after World War Two. And I've seen very smart people writing, you know, right after World War Two, our debt was so high, but we brought it down really quickly. There's, it's not necessarily a problem. Everything that was working for us then is working against us now. Right after World War II, we had demographics completely on our side with, with uh, the baby boomers in place in the workforce where that was moving into um, helping promote growth. And we carried basically balanced budgets or close to balanced budgets right after um, and had a massive period of economic growth. Will you give me the thumbs up if is, is am I glitching? You're okay. I think you're okay. Am I? Yeah. Okay. I'm still getting this sign saying my internet is unstable. So sorry. Yeah, if I'm, no, I, I, sorry. Yeah, if you're okay. Yeah. Uh, Don't want yeah. it to feel like. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so it's not going to be post World War II. We are not going to bring our debt back down from above 100% to 50% anytime soon. 
I will be lucky if uh, in my lifetime I see debt as a share of GDP at 60%, which used to be the target we were shooting for on the way back to historical levels. I just think uh, we have gotten so many periods of kind of layering it on and built in problems. So this is not like World War II. The second myth that you hear so much about is don't worry about it, interest rates are so low. Um, that is dangerous. That is a really dangerous thing to lull us into not worrying about it. There's a whole lot of work about there about how interest rates are lower than growth. Don't mat, don't worry about it. The more you take advantage of that and borrow, the more that relationship becomes unsteady, just like my internet keeps telling me it is. So the more you borrow, the more you push interest rates up against the growth rates, which come down. Um, also, there is the actions of the Fed, which are not guaranteed at all to be the same as they are going forward. I think we put the Fed in a very complicated situation where if interest rates do go up, it has a massive effect on us fiscally. And so it's much harder for the Fed to manage the economy. Um, but nobody should be thinking that the laws of economics are gone and interest rates will be low forever. And if and when they go up, it's like um, a, it's like a credit card teaser rate, right? The higher our debt load is, the more vulnerable we are to increasing rates. Um, Okay, let's now move on to what we've done since we got here and we can move on to the next slide. That's the one that we already saw, that's the debt. And then the next slide talks a little bit about where we are and what we're up to. So we have launched this program I'm really excited about and I encourage everybody to go look at it, COVID Money Tracker at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. We will be tracking all of the money that is approved to fight the recession and pandemic, um, the money as it's dispersed, so how much is out the door, and the overall deficit impact, because some of this money will come back um, because it was in the form of loans, where some of the money will be permanently put into the economy. Um, and it's really helpful. I use it all the time because there are dollars changing. There's a different chart on it, um, which you can also look at, but it's really neat. It sort of shows what kinds of this this one that we're looking at right now shows us the agency whether it's legislative out of the white house administrative which is a small amount or the fed which is a massive amount and the next chart and i'm happy to go back and forth between the two of them shows where the money has come from and where it's gone to and so i really encourage people to take a look at this um here's what i would say about our response i think excuse me I think our response at so far in the beginning of, of this downturn was truly, truly remarkable. And I say that acknowledging all the glitches and there will be tons of stories of PPP loans that went out that just have the least sympathetic recipients you could think of. And frankly, with every one of those stories, it leads to the loss of trust that we need to have where people actually believe that the trillions of dollars that are being spent are not going out for political reasons. Um, and when you see the stories where it's not right who got them, or it might be right, but it doesn't sound right on the surface, every one of those harms further activities. And likewise, there have been real challenges that I've been struck by and like, God, our systems feel like they're from the 19. 30. I mean, it's ridiculous how outdated our systems with everything from not being able to get money into people's pockets in a reasonable amount of time to our incredibly outdated UI systems in the states, which can't talk to each other and can't update their funding. So we're at this point where we have crazy policies where we have bonuses, which leave many people getting more in unemployment funds than they were getting paid to work. And that's obviously counterproductive in terms of the incentives it creates. So there are a lot of glaring examples of what have gone wrong, but I say those to get them out of the way because the story is here, we put a lot of money in the economy in a bipartisan fashion that for the most part did an exceptional job of, of, of meeting the three T's of what you want to do, which is temporary, timely, and targeted and got that money into the economy really quickly. And I think it was a heroic effort. And again, for a Congress that could fight about the color blue, it was really good that it was able to be bipartisan and done in a way for a moment, it felt like the country could come together around a crisis and that this could help um, be a unifying moment as the response went out. So huge, um, I think, uh, credit goes to that. And 
it's it is really interesting to see the work that's been done here but so much of it so the legislative policies um 3.6 trillion dollars has been passed and about um this is a little bit outdated a little bit more than two trillion has been put into the economy already and as I said, the really huge amounts of money are what the Fed have made available so that there are just unlikely to be liquidity concerns when there is such a commitment to keeping the doors to loans um, and through asset purchases, keeping keeping interest rates down. There's such a huge commitment there. Um, so we could switch to the next slide just to be able to see um, I think that's really interesting to think about how the money's gone. There's stories out there, all the, you know, sort of the anti stories of all the money's gone to Wall Street. The, a really significant focus of this has been getting money into small businesses. It's debatable the extent to which um, they will survive. The longer this goes on, the more questions will start to come up about are we propping up businesses, industries that aren't going to survive? We've had a phenomenon in this this economy with interest rates being so low that it's put created both asset bubbles and massive amounts of investment in, in keeping companies alive that shouldn't necessarily be. Um, there's a huge risk that that will happen here, but there was no time to sort that out in the beginning process. Um, I do think as we have more time now and we start to contemplate, contemplate the next rounds, it's really important to try to move from the timely that we did so well into the targeted of really starting to think about where the long-term shifts in the economy are going to be and make sure if we're putting another trillion or more into the economy, we're consistent with the direction the economy will go in both as it's as it's kind of hanging on in life support now, but also as it starts to recover. Okay, so if we think about what we're going to for the next package, I would say it is as certain as anything in Washington is these days that we will have a next package. There is certainly broad-based agreement of kind of all lawmakers, whatever they're saying, that there needs to be something. I mean, there are some who are starting to talk about the debt as a reason not to, but I think they are hiding between this behind the safe cloth of knowing that a package will pass without their vote. So I think everybody uh, believes and kind of understands that the economy is not able to walk and stand on its own quite yet. So there will be another package. Um, and I think um, there are kind of three things to think about in what that package should look like. Uh, certainly what's going on state and local, I think that's the centerpiece of what it will be and what it will need to be because state and local governments obviously can't, can't run deficits like the federal government can. And so to avoid further furloughs, layoffs, or cutting in necessary benefits, um, I think you're going to see a, a huge demand for additional resources there. There has been pushback centered on bailing out irresponsible states. I must admit I am sympathetic to that not in the way of we shouldn't give money to the state and local governments, but in the way that I would be very eager to find ways to tie the money that goes to state and local governments to requiring reforms in anything from rainy day funds to the outdated unemployment insurance. Um, and I would even say to pension systems. So there are states that have so many problems. This is a chance to kind of have a, a carrot also serve as a stick and that there's some reforms that really need to be going on there. You wouldn't say immediately. You would say these are um, money that never has to be paid back as long as these reform metrics are met in the next five years. I mean, it could be really not onerous, but just putting putting in motion the kinds of reforms that need to happen. I think a second factor in thinking about this is the massive amount of uncertainty. As the virus is starting to pick up, we just have no idea. Um, where we're going, if we're headed back into a really bad spot or if we've kind of learned some lessons and we can get control of it, there's still the very important um, tensions between fighting the virus and the economic damage it's doing. I am in the camp that the best thing we can do to help the economy is get control of the virus. But I also think this last may last long enough that we should be thinking about how to have an economy that can actually um, exist while we are fighting the virus. So spending some money on the kinds of things that would make certainly essential work safer and um, medium levels of work doable, that all seems very important to me. And the third piece is we should really look at what's happened here as 
um, a mega disruption. Like there are disruptions all the time you know, from new technologies. This is an event that has clearly showed us to the extent where you start to wonder if some parts of the economy are almost made up, but have shown us we should be doing more in online technology and healthcare, for instance. There's just no question that we could be doing more and we could be doing it better. And there are entrenched interests that are gonna push back against that. Um, but it's critically important to take this moment to understand what trends of changes are going to happen and help them happen more productively and consistent with long-term changes in the economy. So I think um, starting to think about recovery packages that will be consistent with those longer term trends are really important. One can look at how you think about a package either from the top down or the bottom up. And I would argue that you have to do both. From the top down, you wanna think about how big the output gap is going to be. And again, due to that uncertainty, we truly don't know, but we've come up with estimates or CBO, we've come up with estimates based on the work of CBO so far that show the output gap will be roughly 700, 750 billion over the next six months or two trillion over the next two years. The longer you go out, obviously, the less we know, the less we know. And so you will need to figure out how to have funds to close whatever amount of the gap you want to close based on the multiplier or the effects on the economy of any specific policies you think about. But this should not be an exercise of one side saying one side saying I want a package of one trillion dollars and the other side saying I care more than you do. So I want two trillion dollars and the other side saying, oh, I'm so wrong. I care more like we see bidding up as virtue signaling in the budget all the time. That's not what we should do here. We should figure out what the size of a package should be because of uh, what what you want to fill in over what time period. That's top down and then bottom up. You want to think about, OK, and where should that money go? How is that divided between healthcare needs, further things we need to be doing and testing and contact tracing and uh, different medical innovations along the way. What hardships still need to be alleviated? Um, I have to point out that incomes are actually higher right now than they were pre-coronavirus. So while the hardships are still there, certainly across uh, many people, families, obviously anybody who's sick, but overall on the macro level, the economy has done, a, we, or the policies have done a very good job of keeping people's incomes high. Um, but you want to alleviate you want to fight the health pandemic. You want to alleviate hardships. You want to think about what's important for the overall economy. I think that state and local piece is really critical there because of the negative effects of not getting any money as uh, their new fiscal year start. Something I already mentioned, actually the other two um, I already mentioned, but getting money to viable companies. So providing those bridge loans until the economy is open again for business and they are able to to perform as opposed to realizing what things may change forever. Uh, one, I really have no idea, commercial real estate. I don't understand what's going to happen to commercial real estate, but smarter people on commercial real estate than I should be making projections and thinking about to what extent do you want to pump all the same money into that area versus recognize trends or changes that will be happening. The easy, the easy one to point out is cruise liners, but recognizing these kinds of changes are on the horizon and we don't want to prop up businesses for months and months and months that are just going to go belly up at the end. And then finally, as we move out of this period into a real recovery, thinking about what kind of structural changes should happen in the economy. Things we should not have that will be and are popping up all over the place. We should not turn this into a political Christmas tree. This should not be filled with things that people wanted before. Um, you know, there'll be plenty of business tax cuts, credits for travel, the payroll tax cut does not seem targeted well at all to me, given other options. Uh, sorry, everyone in California, but the SALT deduction, I'm not sympathetic to changing that as part of, of the economic bill. Um, it's a, it's, we, we can go into it. I'm sure there'll be people who disagree, but doesn't belong in a bill like this. Um, and so really again, to the point of, we don't know how long we're going to need to be doing borrowing for this for for economic measures. You do not want to compromise the credibility by getting back to Washington sort of politics as usual and people Christmas treeing these things up. And the more we can avoid avoid that, the more important it is for the long term ability for the government to respond based on actual economic reasons. Let me take my last few minutes to transition to what we do when we get out of here and the national debt and the fiscal picture. 
Um, and it is it is uncomfortable for someone like me who's, whose career is focused on fiscal responsibility. And again, fiscal responsibility is not balancing the budget. It is using debt for economic purposes, not political purposes. It's having the economic reasons guide our decision-making about when to borrow and when not, instead of what we do, which is just don't like paying for things, so we go ahead and borrow. Um, so it is uncomfortable for me to be saying we should be borrowing, but to be completely clear, this is a moment we should be borrowing. And it really should not be constrained. Um, it should be constrained by stupid ideas, but it should not be constrained uh, if we need to do it. What should be recognized is we came into this position horribly, dangerously, and irresponsibly unprepared. Um, but we move ahead. Uh, and what you want to do is figure out how you move into making sure that that final piece that's getting control of the debt is included in the recovery uh, once we're recovered, which we didn't do last time. The deficit did come down when the economy improved, as it would have on its own. But we didn't ever take smart measures. We did take some stupid measures, letting some tax rates go back up and the sequester, which were both broad, non-targeted, non-pro-growth policies to get the debt under control. When what we should have done is smart entitlement reforms, um, tax reform that included uh, the lower rates, which we got, but not the broader base. There, there's a trillion dollars in tax expenditures every single year in our budget, so many of them which are inefficient and regressive and there's no oversight on them. So we should have done smart fiscal consolidation during the last last recovery period. We didn't. We need to next time. The idea that I'm pushing to do that, do for that is, I think in our next economic package, um, we should include what I think of as the fiscal pivot, but the agreement that when the growth numbers hit X and unemployment hits Y, and hopefully the Fed is, is in a position to accommodate this, we will then pivot away from economic measures, away from waiting and hoping that the economy, the recovery sticks, and into getting the debt under control. And you can focus a lot on the kinds of policies that are, that kind of have cumulative effects gradually, putting in things that phase in slowly, whether it's raising the retirement age in our in our entitlement programs or changing our calculation to change CPI, which is the right way to calculate inflation, changing some of those tax expenditures. There are a whole lot of gradual policies that we could kind of even agree to now as soon as possible and recognize that they should phase in if and when, but for sure, when the economy is strong enough to accommodate them. My um, small like bright light of political optimism comes from the fact that there are 60 members in the House of Representatives, 30 Republicans and 30 Democrats, if you can believe it, who signed a letter suggesting exactly that. Um, Jody Arrington from Texas and Scott Peters from California are the two who've taken the lead on that letter, really did an impressive job of bringing together a very bipartisan group from the extremes. And, and we hold these really neat meetings with them where we bring in speakers and talk about the debt. So many of these people have never worked together before, but they do believe that in order to borrow now without worrying about it, you need to agree that you will get control of the fiscal situation later. And they have very different visions of what that should look like, but they agree that there should be a framework with which to do it. And that has been highly, highly encouraging to me. Um, the last thing is just what the kinds of ideas, they put examples of what might work there. One was a fiscal state of the nation, which is every year you would have a report that talks about the fiscal, the finances of the country, and that would be presented to the country. That's nice. It's such a nice political thing because it could actually make a bit of a difference where it focuses attention, but it's not hard at all. Like, honestly, whoever objects to the fiscal state of the nation will be, in my mind, the kind of people who just can find a no in any place you look when there should be a yes. It just, there's no reason to object to something that's just more better transparency. So there's ideas like that that are relatively simple, um, all the way to the notion of putting in debt targets, debt to GDP targets that you would start to strive for. So instead of going up to 108 and 110 and 115, we would phase that down. Right now, when you pass a budget, there's no budget constraint. You can borrow as much as you want. There's the debt ceiling, which probably should be um, replaced with something more workable now that's kind of become weaponized in political discussions. But that's literally the only constraint that's there. So debt to GDP targets that phase in more aggressively once the economy's strong could really work. 
or the final idea, which is something called the Trust Act, which I love. It has bipartisan, bicameral sponsors in the Senate. It's it's um, kind of the developed by Mitt Romney, and he's partnered with um, Joe Manchin in the Senate. And there's a number of co-sponsors, both sides. And what that says is any program that has a trust fund, Social Security, Medicare, Highway, um, if that trust fund is going to run out of resources in 15 years, it would have a special commission that's put together to try to fix that program. So you would look at each of these programs on their own, Social Security, Medicare, other programs. If we could see some momentum, the, the reason this idea is so good is that it actually gives you permission to borrow now when you should, while tying your own hands a little bit, you can't really tie Congress's hands, but at least creating a nudge so that they'll do the hard work of paying for it once the time is right. But it doesn't disrupt the need to deal with the immediate emergency, which is the first thing that should be on our list of priorities right now, by getting into the hard work of what policies, how much will be taxes, how much will be spending. It doesn't get into that yet, but it's kind of like um, the small incremental baby steps to getting to where the real work will be done. So with that, I um, think I have covered everything I could think of. I would love to have the discussion. Uh, okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Maya, for those uh, for all that information and uh, super helpful, super insightful. And yeah, there, there were a couple of positive nuggets in there. So that was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, lots of good questions. And I have plenty to, I'm just going to start with one of my own and then I'm going to start pulling some from the audience because we a lot of questions have come in. So my question for you um, is how. So today on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, there was this really striking picture that looked at the daily number of new COVID cases in the U.S. versus the EU. So we look back in early April, the two places were about the same, about 30,000 new COVID cases a day between the two. Um, and in the months since, in the three months since, um, cases have come down to about 4,000 in the EU from about 30,000 new per day. And that, I think, is... And, I mentioned the EU partly because just yesterday they, they agreed on a big new stimulus package of a couple trillion dollars. Um, I'm sure share some features with the US stimulus program. The US and EU are about the same. Uh, US cases came down from about 30,000 a day to 20,000 a day in early June. But then over the last six weeks, the cases in the US has gone up by a factor of three to about 67,000 daily over a seven day moving average. And I guess what I wanted to ask you is how this affects how you think about the amount of stimulus and the composition of the stimulus, because on the round, the CARES Act, when it was being negotiated, a lot of discussion was given, let's get through these next few months and then we're gonna flatten the curve and bring cases way down. But we wanted to tide people over during this tough time and um, but now it looks like we're in a very different place. We have more than twice as many cases as we did um, back then. So, uh, can you help us think through, like, does it strengthen the case for aggressive stimulus or weaken the case somewhat? Because if we're if this is the you know if this is going to be around for a long time, we we only have so much money potentially. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, like, how does it? How no, that cost calculation. Yeah, that's a great question, and so it certainly. Um, I mean, it both, in my mind, increases the size that we will have to put into the economy, um, but you have to weigh that against the debt effects. It either means we should put in less stimulus now and we're going to pay the price and our economy is going to be worse and there's going to be more hardship, or what I would choose, which is we're going to have to put more money into dealing with this moment and we're going to have to be willing to do even greater cuts down the road. And what concerns me is, there's no way to lock people into the greater cuts. And I should say greater cuts and tax increases, all sides of the budget, but there's no way to lock people into that. And the people will be different. So some people who are in Congress now who are doing the borrowing part are much more likely to say like, yeah, we'll do that. Um, wink, wink, I'm retiring in two years, four years, leave those hard choices to somebody else, which is why I believe finding any mechanisms now that can start to build those is the most important kind of first step in making it more likely to happen. Uh, the big model in all this is the 1983 Social Security reforms, um, where they raised the retirement age, but it didn't phase in for many years. 
And so the benefit of that is like the people who had put it on paper, nobody minded at the time, went in later. Nobody was that angry with um, the exception of my father who called me yelling at me saying it was clearly my fault, even though I was in high school at the time. But since I was in social security reform then, it was my fault. Um, but those policies, like I'm, you know, I'm kind of the pure policy person who wishes good policy just ruled the day. And I find politics a distraction and dysfunctional. But you can't do what I've done for this long without starting to realize you better be realistic or you're going to be banging your head against the wall, which is what I've done for my career. Uh And um, clearly coming up with these models that instead of talking about hard choices and saying we need to pick and choose and if it's worth doing, it's worth paying for. But finding these models where you put in slow policies now that phase and accumulate their savings over time are really smart effect. But the other thing to your excellent point is the uncertainty is skyrocketing. And uncertainty is one of the worst things you can do for the economy, but that is the situation that we have. And that's why I've shifted from let's put all this money into like, let's shut the economy down. Let's keep people, you know, surviving. Let's put money into healthcare. But I now think we need to start thinking about, okay, how do we function in this new COVID world? Because it's not going away as quickly as it could have or should have. Um, but what's the smartest thing to deal with the economy in that reality? And I think it means, should there be money that's spent on retrofitting different offices? I know for me, as I think about my decision to go back to my office, um, there's a lot of fixed costs in terms of going. Um, and now we can't take that money because the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget's just not going to take federal money to retrofit our office. That would be unfortunate. But um, a lot of companies and firms need help doing that and that's what they should do and thinking about different ways we should be putting money god knows we should be putting money into our schools so that we can figure out how we're going to teach in a meaningful and functioning way in the fall um so that's how it's changed my outlook which is we'll probably have to put more money in that will probably make the fallout of this harder and slower growth later once the debt effects are even worse but we should go ahead and do it Um, And we should really think about how that changes a lot of the direction of where we should be putting the money. So again, bottom up, it's going to have to be bigger. Uh, Top down, it's going to have to be bigger. Bottom up, more of it's going to have to be how you make an economy work with this ongoing situation. Great. Okay. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, and let's see. Um, uh, So this is a question, one of the questions from the audience. uh, how much debt capacity does the U.S. have? And if the debt gets too large, what are the possible consequences? Is it like hyperinflation or just really high taxes? Or how do you, because yeah. you show these figures about it rising and unprecedented levels higher than ever since World War II, and we're about to surpass that. But you know, some might say, well, big deal. Like, so where do, where does, where do we hit a point where we hit a reckoning sort of? Right. Um, and forgive me if I've shared this story with you, but there's just one story that encapsulates this for me, which was the dinner party I went to where a gentleman decided he wanted to know what the invisible dog fence felt like. And so he strapped the dog collar on his neck and walked to the edge of the yard and fell over in tremendous pain because apparently invisible dog fences feel terrible. And so to me, that's the tipping point of the debt. We don't know where it is. And if so stupid that we find out it is going to be brutal because you won't be able to catch up it's just like you know catching up on any of these things is so much harder than than fixing it in advance um it is higher than we thought it was because other countries have continued to have faith in the u.s um i many people don't think our relationship with china plays into that I do. I think it's worth considering that China owes a, owns a trillion dollars of our debt and that that can, if you are continuing to have high level tensions, um, they don't necessarily get played out just on the soybean field. There's lots of other tools when there's tensions between countries like us and China. Um, and so I think that uh, just just the situation of not worrying about other countries continuing to demand our debt is naive. That could change at any moment. But I don't think it changes very quickly because other countries are in really bad shape and there's nobody else who's giving us a real run as an alternative. There are a lot of people who want to, but I think that's more likely in decades than years. So we don't know what the level is. Japan's at 240, um, debt is share of GDP, we're at 100. 
but Japan has massive domestic savings that we do not, right? So they all purchase that debt. I think it's going to have a big effect on how the Fed is able to maneuver. But I think the real question is, so what happens if we don't get ahead of that? And the risk is there's higher interest rates that's seeming less and less likely because that will be controlled. There's inflation. And there's what I think is probably the realest risk, which is, and there are probably a bunch of people who are here in this conversation who are more experts than I am. Um, uh, but the effect on our currency is what I'm really worried about. I think this changes the dynamic of the U.S. dollar, and it, it speeds up the change in that. And I don't think you realize how good it is to be the currency that's the safe haven until you lose it. And it seems like we might lose it in record time if we don't figure out how to budget more responsibly. Right. Really interesting. Um, that's great. And I do think yesterday, I can't remember if it was Wall Street Journal or New York Times, but they sort of contrasted the very different budget situation that Germany entered this uh, here, here in the U.S. that they had been running a uh, surplus. But uh, in, okay, so another question from the audience. Do you think there will be a point where we will no longer have enough money to both finance our national debt while continuing to fund our other needs like defense and so forth? Well, we always have enough money because we can print it, um, but that's not a good thing to do, right? That's what leads to all of the other problems with, throughout the economy. Um, but I think more relevant than, than that is I don't think there is a political willingness to go to the levels that we would need to finance the debt we have on the trajectory we have. It's not just the debt where we are. It's that the trajectory has us borrowing and I'm sorry, I forget the exact number, but 14 trillion or more over the next 10 years that we've already built in. So it's that the debt is at close to unprecedented levels and it's projected to grow faster than the economy forever. That's what makes something unsustainable if it's growing faster than the overall economy. So you have that and you have huge, I mean, if I don't know how to count how big the different divides between the two parties are. I say this as a political independent who is exasperated with parties, parties in general don't understand, uh, don't feel that they serve much of a purpose these days. But if you look at the divides, the different preference between small and large government is so big that there is a huge portion of the country that is not going to accept the government growing significantly higher, right? It's on track to grow from where it's typically been 20, 21, 22 percent of GDP up to close to 30. That's before you start to meet the all the unmet needs that exist. So we have focused on consumption at the expense of investment, where we'd increase the investments and even try to catch up and deal with new threats. I think our defense budget is painfully and dangerously outdated and ready to fight all the wars of the last century and none of the ones of this century. So if you were to start investing in those areas, you're talking about massive growth in government. There is seriously a political constraint way before you get there. So that is really one of the problems that I see. I don't see how this plays out, that we are able to make good on things we've put into the budget as promises, um, finance this ongoing level of debt in terms of the interest, and even contemplate some of the unmet needs. And that's before the kinds of promises that you're hearing from some folks um, in terms of massively expanding Social Security, right? Like giving me more Social Security benefits. Please don't. Please don't do that. Let's use that money for something else. But there's a whole lot of promises. Massive expansion of existing benefit programs before we even deal with the things that I'm concerned about, which is the lack of investment in human capital, the fact that I think our budget does very little for, ch for children compared to what it does for seniors, um, for basic R&D, a lot of the research and development issues. So. There will be constraints. It's not from printing money, but it is both economic and political. Okay, thanks for that helpful answer. And another question <clears throat> has to do with uh, just a, sort of a mechanical issue about financing the deficit. Um, as you know, interest rates right now are at peculiarly low levels. Um, that's And that's across the yield curve from like three month securities up to 30 year securities. And you know how are uh, policymakers making decisions, or do they have the uh, to decide how much of the debt to borrow in short-term securities, this really long-term securities? Like you could potentially lock in a lot of the debt right now with 30-year securities, where you've got that low interest rate locked in for a long time, versus having to roll over the debt 
month after month, year after year, where you're more vulnerable to interest rate increases. Do you have a sense of like it, it, how, how that is playing out? Yeah, that was something that a lot of people were pushing a number of years ago. And I know that Treasury has done, re I mean, Treasury's always thinking about it. They have massive models that balance the different needs in terms of cost and liquidity and keeping the available amounts of Treasuries for different maturities that there's a demand for. So they are well on top of that. Um, and recently they were looking at that because, again, rates were so low and we were issuing so much debt. And there was not a demand for the long-term Treasuries, for the long-term um, 30 and even people are talking about 15, 100 years. So there is, you have to look at how much the demand is and, and locking in at those low rates was not appealing. Um, so I don't think there'll be as much of a switch as they were contemplating from what I understand. The thing I want to point out, because one of the big myths is that low interest rates basically mean, I mean, this is, this confusion is running, it's quite politically conven convenient. It's running pretty widespread out there, but low interest rates make these things free. And that is 100% not true. Low interest rates mean that the cost of borrowing is extremely low, much, much lower than certainly I would have ever thought it would be with this fiscal situation. Um, and that's from a variety of factors from globalization to long-term pessimism about growth and demographics to the activities of the Fed. But those low rates mean it's very, very cheap to borrow, but it doesn't mean you don't have to pay for what you're doing. So if you're borrowing $100 billion, you can delay the cost of paying it, but you still have to pay the $100 billion with some small amount of interest on it. And so what you're doing is you're shifting the costs of something to somebody else. Uh, my kid, who you kind of saw in the background a little bit there for a moment, like he's a teenager. I think he totally deserves us to give him $20, $20 trillion in debt. I've been locked in a house with him for four months, but <laughs> normally, it is not the view of all of us that we should make the next generation pay for all the things that we are not. And so borrowing in so many ways is saying, oh my God, asking people to pay for what we're doing or doing trade-offs and cutting some of the spending is so hard, so let's borrow. And confusing rates are so low with we should go ahead and do that for everything. It still has to be worth the cost. And I just think that's so important on interest rates because it's like, it is just spread like wildfire, kind of this notion of like, oh, it makes that thing free. We should get everything now. Right. Okay, another, I'm going to try to get in two more questions from the audience uh, before we wrap up. Uh, so the first one is the market based on the pricing of inflation protected bonds seem to be anticipating some moderate inflation over the next few years, but continued near zero short term rates. Do you agree with that assessment? I think inflation, okay, so first off, one, I briefly worked on Wall Street, left and found a, a passion for fiscal policy, but also realized I can't predict anything. Two, no one can predict inflation very well, including markets. Um, three, the most, I can see like every scenario, the most logical scenario to me is that inflation stays incredibly low right now. Um, and that is because the demand is not going to exceed the ability of, of things to buy and including sort of uh, trade flows, it makes that very, very unlikely. But it could be that we, the economy, you know, suddenly takes an uptick and suddenly there's a rush to, to, to buy and spend and produce. It could, the dynamics could change really suddenly. But I think what's likely is inflation stays quite low for a short amount, for a medium amount of time, probably longer than a couple years. But that then this whole dynamic of pumping this much money into the economy, no matter what we're trying to do to like hold it back and build a dam against it, I think it does push out. So I think we're likely to see, not likely, I think it's quite plausible we will see significant inflation in the medium term, but it's not what keeps me up at night right now. What okay. keeps me up at night, I should, besides everything, um, I should be clear is that it's the weakening of the country. It's not any one thing. It's not interest rates are going to happen or the dollar. It's not all like which thing is going to move in the economy. It's that we are running our country for the short term with no strategy, no focus on the long term, no concept of what sort of a sustainable growth set of policies could look like. And I just feel like we are a country that is running our running our nation blindly. And so my biggest concern is that our fiscal situation reflects how 
irresponsible we're being and sort of thinking about what the challenges and opportunities are in the world and how we should be setting ourselves up to meet them because we could be my god i look at your background i look at stanford like where the both <laughs> things come out right we could be doing so well and so many fronts and i feel like we're just walking ourselves into that invisible dog fence over and over and over again did that really happen the invisible dog fence it really happened <laughs> it is a vision and an experience that does not leave you does not leave you the same it was scarring Wow. The, okay. The, the super boring, and that spiced things up. And thank God it wasn't me who thought that would be a good idea. But yikes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> One last question. We're slightly over, but uh, <clears throat> I'm a senior living on Social Security plus investment income, already using some capital each year. How worried should I be? Not at all. Um, I mean, if I were making the, if it were for, for me, and you are a senior who's living on a ton of investment income, I would say. You shouldn't get all of your Social Security, uh, but that's me. I'm not in politics. I'd never be in politics, nor would I ever win. There is a, such a strong ironclad commitment from all members of Congress that if we make the needed fixes to Social Security, um, people who are already retired will not be affected. That said, so I'm going to amend my answer, that's if we do something. That's if we do the right thing, which is fix Social Security. The right thing would have been to fix Social Security 20 years ago when we knew about the problem so that we could have phased in these changes in a way that barely affected anyone. No one would have even noticed. We've waited so long that the changes we have to put in place will be painful, either on the tax or spending side. They will affect people who either count on Social Security for a significant amount of their retirement or, or a, a moderate amount and or people who don't really can't afford a higher payroll tax are going to get hit with one. So we've waited so it's going to be painful. But again, it's not going to be painful to you if you're a senior unless we do nothing. And if we do nothing, it's going to be really painful because literally if we wait until the Social Security trust funds don't have the money that's promised, which is in about 10 years, 12 years, um, and there are plenty of politicians who are arguing to do that. And it sounds cynical, but it's true because it's a better issue to keep alive for partisan politics and pointing at the other guy and saying they're going to take your Social Security. President Trump said it this weekend. He accused Democrats of being ready to hop on and take people's Social Security. Um, and I just I could not be more clear on anything than the fact that we should be making the fixes to Social Security ahead of time. That is the best way to do them. That protects the people who depend on the program the most and um, phase all those changes in gradually and actually leave people better off than they, they would have been, like than they think they're going to be. You could still have benefits rising because they're indexed in two different ways. But if we wait and we don't do anything, then in about 12 years, there will be an abrupt across the board benefit cut for everybody of about 20, 22 percent. Um, it shouldn't happen. I would have said I don't think it will happen because I've always believed that we'll get our act together when it comes to enacting the obvious policies that we should be enacting. But um, I don't discount anything these days. Um, but if we make reforms to Social Security, what really, what really frustrates me is when people scare people who are living on Social Security and seniors who are already retired saying they're going to gut your benefits. Like that's no politician in their right mind is talking about doing that. And really, I, I will say everybody should want us to fix Social Security. It is in no way saying how you think we should fix it. We have a really cool tool actually on our website, the Social Security Fixer. You all can go on and figure out how you would fix Social Security. You can do it on all all benefit reductions. You can do it all in tax increases. You would do it like I would on a mix of all of them. Um, but just saying that we should address it when the trustees of the program every single year write notes in the annual report saying this program is unsustainable and it's going to run out of, uh, it's not going to have sufficient resources to pay for promised benefits and the sooner we make changes the better. We should really listen to them and we should be making those changes. Wow. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Maya. I hope we have many, many uh, watchers, listeners today, and I hope many of them are in Washington, D.C. and listening closely to your suggestions for proposed policy changes. Uh, but with that, I think we should wrap up. Sorry, everyone, for going a little bit over, but this was uh, so grateful, Maya, for you making time for our community, for the CEPR community. 
So I, I wish we could all uh, applaud, but thank you uh, again and hope to see everyone again uh, soon and, um, and uh, I hope all of you have a great day and stay safe and healthy during these times.